um, thank you for joining us on this uh, lovely day here in Pretoria, in South Africa. It has been relatively cold, comparatively. Um, Your Excellencies, um, Royal Highnesses, uh, thank you for uh, your participation in this uh, important discussion on women, tradition, and uh, culture. I am just waiting for um, Princess Her Royal Highness Stella Sitrao. She was going to do the introductions, um, but I thought I could uh, start off in the meanwhile and um, and hand over to uh, Her Royal Highness uh, Lorato Mabellane um, from the Princess of Royal Network to take us further and get this webinar started off. Um, in August, South Africa celebrates Women's Day, the 9th of August. It was a day where in 1959, uh, women, South African women of all backgrounds um, joined in to protest the past laws. It means carrying off some sort of uh, identity uh, so that you could, especially for black people who could be stopped at any time uh, to uh, you know, identify themselves. Uh, I mean, this is in South Africa, they're South African women. And um, they, they, March to the union buildings to protest this um, hence act of carrying out a, a pass and uh, the oppressive nature of it. Today, uh, we are the Diplomatic Society with the South African Royal Princesses Network. Uh, we'll tackle some of the issues uh, around women, culture, uh, tradition. Um, and um, with that, I would like to pass on to uh, Princess Lerato Mabelane. Lerato, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Curtin. Um, I'd like to greet everybody. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome and greet all the Royal Majesties, all the Royal Highnesses, every dignitary representatives of government, private entities and NGOs who are here with us today. Thank you everyone for making time for this webinar. We are gathered here today and it has been made possible by the South African Royal Princesses Network as well as the Diplomatic Society. Um, and we just heard Mr. Kurt, who is a representative of the Diplomatic Society. Now the South African Royal Princesses Network is a progressive association of royal princesses from diverse parts of South Africa who wish to make a difference to their communities and contribute meaningfully to a better South Africa and world at large. And I myself am, am a proud member of the South African Royal Princesses Network. It has truly become like a sisterhood um, that is all about community development and growth, in, especially in our rural areas around South Africa. Now we have just, entered into the month of August and this month is known and celebrated as Women's Month in South Africa. And to mark this, the South African Royal Princesses Network, again in partnership with the Diplomatic Society, has made efforts to host this webinar to commemorate the strength and the courage of women in South Africa and while not turning a blind eye to issues and challenges facing women. Uh, Mr. Kurt briefly explained it, but on the 9th of August, 1956, I think we all remember the events which led, which led to the women of, then, of the then dramatically divided South Africa who marched against the apartheid regime. They were protesting past laws that were directed at the majority of the indigenous population of the country. These restricted movement and general oppression and segregation of people solely based on race. This webinar wishes to commemorate the strength and courage of the women of South Africa who continue to play a phenomenal role 
to fight in fighting injustices while also aiming to make a notable contribution to creating a better world. Gender practices, both nationally and globally, will be reviewed as we speak, as we seek to identify the best possible practices. My name is Princess Lerato Mavalani Wabapirimba Mavalani. I am from a village called Mabalstad, about 20 kilometers from Sun City and the majestic uh, Pilanisberg Mountains. So if you know Sun City, I'm not too far from that. Um, I would like to then introduce our speakers here today, and I will start off by introducing Her Royal Highness Princess Stella Sikau. Um, Princess Stella is a senior member of the Mpondo royal family, and in the year 2019, she founded the South African Royal Princesses Network a network which we are very, very proud to have and proud to be members of. It has done amazingly well in a short space of time. And we believe that it will continue to grow as we welcome different princesses from different kingdoms around South Africa to join us um, in the network. Princess Stella is the founder also of the Mbondo Culture and Heritage Festival, which she founded in 2006. And in the year 2008, she founded the Mbondo Reed Dance. She has been involved in issues of gender-based violence since the year 2008, working with institutions like the film and such as child trafficking and pornography in rural areas women and child abuse and empowerment. And she has also worked with Impulse in Switzerland. Um, she worked on sports development with African rainbow minerals. She has worked on issues of skills development with the Department of Labor, amongst others. Princess Stella is also involved in a project of the donation of sanitary towels and books to schools around Mbondoland. She also collaborates with Freedom Park Museum and Heritage Site in Pretoria. She collaborated with them earlier this year to honor Mpondo monarchs who played a role in the liberation struggle. And I was very honored to be amongst the guests at the event this year. It was a very successful event. Princess Stella is a diplomat by profession, having served South Africa in Thailand, Botswana, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, I will now proceed to introducing Mr. Kurtan. I hope I'm saying it right. Mr. Kurtan Bana. Mr. Kurtan is the founder and the director of the Diplomatic Society. Mr. Kurtan has been in the business of media for the past 30 years in various capacities. He has witnessed the transformation of the media industry as a journalist and as a media owner. He has experienced challenges facing media on all the relevant platforms and has had to adapt to the new environment that the fusion of new news, entertainment and technology has created. Mr. Kurtan is a diplomat, has been in the diplomatic in, since, in media since 1997. He's the founder of Foreign Exchange, as well as the founder of the Diplomatic Society media platforms in Pretoria, South Africa. He has a wealth of knowledge of international relations as it relates to South Africa and Africa's engagements with the world. And with regards to who we have on the panel today, we have a variety of amazing men and women who will be speaking on the issues of gender-based violence as it relates to different cultures. Speaker number one will be Princess Yanga Dumalisile. Her Royal Highness Princess Yanga will be sharing on culture and customary practices, the traditional role of women in South Africa, the, ex the South African experience. She is a princess from Kwakaleka, Tosa Kingdom in the Eastern Cape. She's a member of South African Royal Princesses Network. Princess Yanga is an entrepreneur and a qualified dispensing optician and founder and director of YD Optical. Eyewear and eye care, they call themselves the opti opticians who care. 
Her practice is based in Gauteng province. Princess Yanga is an advocate for eye care and eye health and she is a representative with the South African oh, really? Optometric Association. Princess Lorato, if I, if I may just uh, come in there. Um, mm -hmm. uh, maybe we should let um, Princess uh, Stella Sikau uh, okay. make her opening remarks. And then okay. we can go to Princess Yanga. And then after every speaker, we introduce, let, let them uh, deliver their remarks and uh, have their inputs, and then we will take it from there. So each one, right. after you introduce them, let them speak. So can we start, uh, go to Princess Stella Strau? Okay, all right. Thank you very much. Royal uh, Highnesses, um, Royal Highnesses, uh, our moderator, panelists, participants, uh, all protocol observed, greetings everyone. Uh, the issue of gender-based violence is a major challenge globally and is at the center of gross human rights violations and is reported as the least prosecuted of crimes. This webinar seeks to unpack gender-based violence, reflect on customary practices, what has been done, achievements, and what still needs to be done, drawing on national, continental, and international experience. Currently, human trafficking accounts for the top three of the global crimes against humanity, and primary to this is women and child trafficking, mostly for sexual exploitation. It is reported that 70% of women in some countries face physical and or sexual violence in their lifetime. One in three girls in developing countries is likely to be married as a child bride, and according to the World Health Organization, one third of women and girls worldwide experience violence at some point in their lives. It is also estimated that between 25% and 40% of South African women have experienced South, uh, sexual and or physical abuse in their lifetime. And around 50% of women have experienced emotional or economic uh, abuse at the hands of their intimate partners in their lifetime. During lockdown, the cases of gender-based violence are reported to have increased. Regardless of how many initiatives, efforts made, laws passed nationally and internationally to end gender-based violence, and with so many years into our democracy, we are still faced with such challenges, which undermine the very dignity of women and efforts to address this pandemic. It is a sad reality that to date, women are not fully emancipated and continue to be violated and discriminated against. The irony is that women were at the center of our liberation struggle. The likes of Mama Charlotte McLeague, whom this year has been declared in her honor, and many women fought also for total emancipation of women and children. We wouldn't have had achieved our democracy without women playing their role. South Africa currently uh, is known for being one of the countries with the highest cases of gender-based violence. In some African countries, genital mutilation is still practiced which compromises the dignity of women and, and girls whilst undermining their human rights. Right here at home, Okutwala and Ungena customs have been hijacked by criminal elements, including kidnapping and rape, in some instances leading to femicide. In some war-torn countries, women become victims of the worst forms of abuse, including gang rape. In other societies, abuse is so institutionalized such that children grow up believing that it's normal for men to beat or abuse women, and women are treated as perpetual minors. In some societies, children never get an opportunity to enjoy growing up and being children because of being forced into child marriages, which do not wait for their young bodies to develop as they are expected to consummate their marriages and attend to wifely duties. Uh, the list goes on. Gender-based violence impacts negatively on our societies the future, and it destroys lives. Some of the victims suffer for the rest of their lives, including from mental illness. Some become the perpetrators of gender-based violence. Others become cri uh, criminals, whilst others uh, end up losing hope or end up uh, taking, uh, taking their lives. Families are destroyed, youthful dreams shattered, and young minds affected negatively by gender-based violence. This webinar therefore seeks to address gender-based violence by also reflecting on what has been done or achieved. 
identify challenges in an effort to look for solutions and interventions. It seeks to address issues of gender inequality and how they contribute to gender-based violence. It also reflects on the legislative framework drawing from local, continental, and global experiences. Challenges, including on implementation and poor access will be addressed as these may lead to the lack of justice and perpetrators walking free without ever accounting for their crimes. The role of traditional leaders as custodians of custom is imperative. When a crime is committed in the rural areas, it is first reported to the traditional leaders, Omko. Are the traditional councils equipped enough to deal with the issues of gender-based violence? What are traditional leaders doing to address gender-based violence? And what are the challenges they, they encounter? Are they equipped, for instance, with dignity packs? Just to make an example. How far are the clinics or police stations from Omakum Kool? What should be done about the customary practices that have lost their peoples, those that have been hijacked by criminal, criminal elements or impact on gender-based violence? Issues of stigma, victimization, support system for victims of gender-based violence, security in rural areas need to be prioritized. Imperative is also the role of education, advocacy, educating on gender-based violence and empowerment as preventative measures. Critical are also strategic partnerships and collective efforts in the fight against gender-based violence. The partnership with the diplomatic society is such example. And for us as the Princess Network, it couldn't be business as usual. And we decided to take a firm stand against gender-based uh, violence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Princess Stella. What a wonderful, wonderful speech. Welcome. Um, I know you joined us a little late, but thank you very much. Um, I think we will now move on to the first speaker, um, which is Princess Yanga Dumalisile. Princess Yanga, are you ready? Yes, good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to greet everyone who is participating with the webinar for this afternoon. Um, Royal greetings to your Royal Highnesses, um, to our diplomats, and to all the other participants and obviously our panelists uh, at large. Um, my name is Yanga Dumalisile. Um, I'm reading an extract. Um, I'm sharing with you today an extract from um, advocate MJ Maluleke. And the reason I found her article very enlightening because it covers exactly what webinar will be talking on today, which is gender-based violence, specifically in South Africa, and how our cultural norms as South Africans affect it. Um, Advocate Malega writes as follows that um, traditional cultural practices reflect the values and beliefs held by members of a community for periods often spanning generations. Every social grouping in the world has specific traditional cultural practices and beliefs, some of which are beneficial to all members, while others have become harmful to a specific group, such as women. These harmful practices include early and forced marriages, as Princess Stella has already covered, which we call ukutwala, and is currently practiced in South Africa. Virginity testing, um, well known with a redance in, in the KwaZulu Natal region, um, window, uh, widow's ritual. So in, in, our, in our cultures, a lot of the time it's the women that will have to then observe a, a window period of mourning when a spouse, for instance, passes on and they would have to uh, possibly wear a, a, an all black garb for a period of six months, sometimes up to 12. Um, and then she speaks of uh, female genital mutilation, which we've also covered, which is still practiced in our cultures this day. Uh, breast sweeping or ironing, uh, practices such as cleansing after male circumcision and witch hunting. Despite their harmful nature and their violation of natural and international human rights laws, such practices persist because they are not questioned or challenged, therefore take on an aura of morality in the eyes of those practicing them. 
the purpose of this article that she's that she's sharing with us, um, this doctor that advocate Malileke shared with us is to share with us the impact of culture, tradition and customs and law on gender equality and how that now impacts on gender-based violence. Um, I just wanna give you a bit of background um, on, on the culture experience in, in South Africa as a whole. Uh, or Africa, to be honest, as a whole. So African culture has experienced rapid change since the colonial invasion. Contemporary African culture is a mixture of traditional elements and alien features. Local African culture was oppressed for many years um, due to uh, what is different to Western culture and what is practiced in South Africa or Africa as a whole. We find that uh, cultural roots in Western, um, sorry, in all over Africa tend to differ. In South Africa, we have many common um, practices that will vary through male circumcision, for instance, that is practiced in Kosa, Zulu, Sutu, uh, Zwana, and technically all the various cultures in South Africa. So as a society as well, we then look at, um, so these are the cultural norms that we find we practice and which at times may hinder a individuals um, health as we found that we had uh, many, many in, in instances in, 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 in female circumcisions where we have deaths in, 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 in a lot of, a lot of uh, families. Um, Apologies, I was disturbed for a second. I'm uh, still at work. So uh, the South African, uh, South African community as a whole has looked at um, how each of our different cultural practices has actually hindered uh, women's rights and how we as women uh, through Ukutwana, which is the, through the forced marriages of young girls, through, whew, <laughs> Um, through households that have been led by uh, children because of um, deaths in the family. Um, how uh, virginity testing also obviously, um, uh, it, 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 it hinders the women's rights as a whole because now we're put in a space where we are um, publicly tested, and and this is literally a violation of a person's human rights. We looked at uh, she looked at uh, women, uh, um, the rituals where it forces women to uh, to take on obviously the the role of of being uh, both. Um, the, uh, the mom and the father in the home due to various uh, uh, neglect from from the from the men in the in, in the in their households our us as the South African Royal Princess Network have been very affected and and been very influenced and hence we wanted to take a stand and speak out on gender-based violence and how it's actually been um, forced upon us as women, uh, us as the, when I say us, the community of the South African uh, women through various cultural norms that have suppressed us, that have suppressed women. Um, we, would, we are obviously as ooh, Princess Stella has spoken, we as the South African Royal Princess Network are looking to be advocates that will then speak to the chieftainships uh, and uh, speak with the chiefs and work together with them in trying to 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 speak out and 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 bring on a a, a voice that can that can um, stand up for all the the women the children in the various cultures in South Africa that have found that they've got no one to go to. So at present, a lot of the young women, a lot of the moms, a lot of the um, 
the community will go to the royal palaces in the communities and report when something has happened. And unfortunately, what has happened is that uh, not everyone is well equipped to then deal with um, the cases that have been brought forth. In our, in our, in our previous webinars, we spoke, uh, we had speakers that spoke to us on how we as, uh, as the advocates can help in, 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 in bringing cultural leaders to the table. When you say bringing cultural leaders to the table, we need, to, we need our, our chiefs, we need our chief we need our kings and queens and princesses to come on board and then speak on behalf of the various members of our society that have been, that have been uh, victimized through various means of gender-based violence. We will continuously speak out on Ukutwala, we will continue to speak to, off on virginity testing, um, just to name a few, child trafficking, which is very, um, which is huge in South Africa, but we as the South African community do not at present know how to, how to combat it or how to reduce it, so to speak. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand over back to our moderator, Princess Leralto Mabelani, who's then going to introduce our other speakers. And through this webinar, through this conversation, hopefully we'll then come to a, a means to, to hold hands with the Diplomatic Society, for instance, and all the other members that are on this panelist to say, how can we as a South African Royal Princess Network work together with them so that we can then go forth and, and, and be more impactful with, 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 uh, with combating gender-based violence in our traditional um, cultures, in our homes, in the rural areas, which we find that a lot of the time, those areas are, are suffering a lot of neglect because we don't have the right advocates, or even if we do have the right advocates, they do not have the, 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 the individuals behind to help eradicate a lot of the gender-based violence experience within our cultures. I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Princess Bianca. Touching on culture, sharing on culture and customary practices. We actually have two Princess Yangas in the South African Royal Princesses Network. So I'm very happy that there's only one today because it gets quite confusing. Thank you so much, Princess Yanga. Um, without taking any more of your time, I will just get into introducing our second speaker. And we will now have Prince, Her Royal Highness, Princess Talente. I hope I'm saying it right. Dlamini Nirenda. She is a princess from the Swatini, Eswatini Kingdom. She's a chief operating op officer of Ubuntu Institute and the chairperson of the National Arts Council. She is also a former chairperson of the Arts Scape Theatre. Um, this is the Western Cape State Theatre, where she served as a member of council for six years. Her Royal Highness is a seasoned social entrepreneur who has worked with numerous international donor organizations and local development finance institutions in implementing and or promoting the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals over the last 15 years. That is the SDG, the United Nations SDG. She is currently the Chief Operating Officer at Ubuntu Institute for Young Social Entrepreneurs. And she is also a patron of the Women's Achievement Network for Disability. That is the WAND in South Africa. Internationally, she serves as a board member of the Black Sea Caspar C International Fund and is, is an Apshaya Anamori International Fellow under the US Center for Strategic and Intern Stud International Studies. She also served on the Laureals, sorry, L'Oreal International Efforts in achieving its sustainable objectives. In recognition of the impact of her youth international exchange programs, the princess was awarded by the mayor the key to the city to the city of Austin, Texas in the United States of America. Her Royal Highness holds a master's degree in entrepreneurship and new venture creation and management advancement program that is the MAP73 both from Wirtz University Business School. She also holds a bachelor of arts degree in business administration from the 
Bene College in North Carolina, United States of America. Um, join me in welcoming Princess Kalentli Lamini. Princess, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Princess Lerato Mabalane. Um, it is such a pleasure um, to be invited to this platform. Um, I also would like to greet um, the Diplomatic Society led, led by Mr. Kiritin Bana, um, and also would like to thank um, the African Royal Princess Network led by um, Princess Delas Gawu. Um, would also like to greet fellow diplomats um, that are here, um, my fellow presenters um, that will be presenting today, as well as um, honorable guests that are listening in on the webinar today. Um, before I start, um, I'd like to wish all the women um, on this platform a very happy Women's Month. Um, you know, it is our month and I really truly am honored, you know, to have been invited today to be able to celebrate women. Um, even though it's such a touchy subject that, you know, we are discussing today, um, but still it's a very important subject that needs to be dealt with head on. And um, who better than um, to lead this than our Princess de la Stau, um, who's leading this very fantastic initiative. Um, I would like to also um, just, you know, give a precursor to say my presentation um, is, is actually based on a um, research that the Ubuntu Institute um, conducted um, some years back um, that focused on the role of traditional leaders in preventing and addressing sexual and gender-based violence. Um, so some of the information that I'm actually going to be presenting on today is taken from real life interviews um, that we conducted um, as the Ubuntu Institute in partnership with the Population Council. Um, and when we were you know, conducting these interviews, we had both female as well as male traditional leaders um, that were giving us their views um, in terms of this very sensitive subject. Um, I'll start with you know, the role of traditional leaders. Um, many communities in rural Southern Africa pay allegiance to a traditional leader. Um, and a traditional leader in the African context is inherently a figurehead that is associated with African traditions, um, cultural practices, and customary law. Traditional leaders also have the influence to promote positive behavior change um, on issues such as the ones that we're discussing today, um, which is gender-based violence. They can also play a very, very pivotal role in educating their constituents and apply customary laws in traditional courts that can begin to reverse the epidemic trends of GBV, especially in rural um, communities. Um, one of the traditional leaders um, that we had um, interviewed you know, said this. He said, it is un-African for a man to beat his wife or partner. In our African culture, a woman is not supposed to be abused and beaten. That is an African. Our culture respects women. So when we actually define gender-based violence from a traditional leadership view, um, you know, most of the traditional leaders that we asked, um, you know, described gender-based violence as any kind of violence against women, disabled, um, you know, individuals, children, and sometimes men. It takes many forms, which is physical abuse, sexual abuse as a result of alcohol abuse and emotional abuse as well. They also acknowledge that gender-based violence mostly affects women more than it does men. And they seem, you know, what was very interesting is that they seem to know very little about SGBV against young boys, um, for example, sodomy, and also complained that the um, definition of sexual gender-based violence usually pertain to women rather than to men, which was very interesting because the reality is, um, you know, most um, gender-based violence victims are actually women. So it would have been rightly so in terms of that perception of the definition. Um, what are the cultural contributing factors that um, actually contribute to gender-based violence? Some of these factors is, um, the weak community sanctions against um, perpetrators. And when we talk about weak community sanctions, I'm gonna discuss a little bit later as well, but it's basically just talking about if a man you know, hits a woman in, in, in the community, and in, in particular, I'm talking about the rural community where um, of course the cultural practices are performed um, you know, most. Um, sometimes it is seen as if, um, you know, there's going to be, there's very weak um, sanctions against the people that actually perpetuate this violence. Um, secondly, 
Another contributing factor is the lack of understanding of women's rights and knowledge about, you know, the various domestic violence acts um, that our legal and our, um, our constitution actually has. Um, thirdly, is the majority of traditional leaders across Southern Africa are men, and the contributions by female traditional leaders are most often either understated or they are overruled. Um, I think it's also a very common fact that, you know, most traditional leaders are men. And, um, you know, that's something that, you know, we do hope in the near future, um, you know, the face of that can then be able to change. Um, in addition, patriarchy being used to justify gender-based violence and women being held responsible for the gender-based violence with little acknowledgement of the role that men actually play in this. And lastly, the disturbing causes that we've often um, heard of that are cited as, as reasons um, for the violence. I mean, we've all heard situations where they'll say it's because she was wearing a mini skirt um, or, you know, it's because she was very drunk and she was on drugs. Um, hence, that's exactly why, you know, um, she then got what she got. Um, or in some very, very sad cases as well, um, where women refuse their partner's conjugal rights. Um, you know, these are some of the factors that, you know, contribute to gender-based violence. So what are the cultural mechanisms that, um, you know, that basically cultural um, leaders use in dealing with gender-based violence? Um, in typical cases, um, gender-based violence reported cases are taken to the traditional courts um, and the traditional courts are usually made up of a council of traditional leaders that, you know, are led by a chief. Um, you know, a case would then be heard in the traditional court system and if then found guilty, the perpetrator is made to pay a penalty of some sorts. Um, mostly, again, it is in the form of cows because in our rural areas, that is the currency still currently being used. Um, and depending on the severity of the, of the case, um, it could then be um, escalated um, to other higher courts. But one of the main things is that traditional court councils um, focus of the penalty is mainly actually on the family rather than the individual. So with the result at times being that the individual actually is expelled from the community. Um, and that usually is because they want to make sure that the family is the one that actually takes um, responsibility for the perpetrator within their communities. Um, however, I think it's very important to note that the method of justice that is served in these cultural communities um, and these traditional courts are actually mainly retributive and not rehabilitative, which is really, really quite um, you know, sad because we would want a situation whereby um, there also is some form, of, um, some form of focus around rehabilitating the perpetrator to ensure that number one, he doesn't repeat it again, but also secondly, um, if they are in you know, um, confines of a family, we don't um, find the sons or the, or the nephews then trying to repeat um, that same behavior that they see is being repeated. So, um, you know, just having some form of um, action around um, rehabilitation would also be very, very key. Um, the challenges in the cultural sector when dealing with um, gender-based violence is that um, at times when the abuse is reported, um, police are not always able to successfully investigate these cases. And when they do, perpetrators are said to actually bribe their way out. This in turn discourages victims or others from reporting abuse um, in the future. In addition, the lack of consultation between the police, the judicial system, and the traditional courts in some communities results in perpetrators defying the traditional court um, ruling system. And then what happens is that the perpetrator is then often released by the judiciary, and this renders the traditional leader's authority null and void. So a traditional court, for example, would have maybe, let's say, had a ruling where they found the perpetrator guilty and they will then hand them over, excuse me, again to the judicial system. And, um, and the system then, you know, sometimes, you know, lets us down. Um, and when this, of course, happens, the perpetrator either will sometimes, you know, in other cases, be turned back into the community. And when they actually then do that, this leaves the, the victim with a stigma, a stigma that then continues to haunt them um, whilst they are still living within the community. So what can we do more of in terms of the role of um, culture, you know, and the role of traditional leadership in addressing gender-based violence? 
Number one, as custodians and protectors of African culture, customs and values, traditional leaders can promote positive values within the communities and advocate for the respect of women and children. Secondly, giving women a more visible role in the various cultural events to further educate and capacitate women and men in particular around issues related to gender-based violence. Thirdly, using cultural platforms dedicated to men only to educate young men on how to value women. women. So for example, um, you know, in, within their initiation ceremony or um, in Swaziland, for example, um, we've got the you know, male ceremony, which is the big one for the year, um, held around um, December, January, called Inguala. Um, you know, it's using these cultural platforms to be able to formally, um, you know, host educational sessions and not only rely on, um, you know, the hot conversations, because I do know that at most times when you speak to the men and you say, well, what happens when you guys are on your own and you're having these, um, you know, cultural excuse me, ceremonies. Um, and they will tell you that, no, we educate the young men, um, we tell them on how to behave. But, you know, the reality is, um, you know, in the world that we're living in now, I think more can be done um, whereby we can be able to give, um, you know, these young men formal, formal educational um, sessions, um, you know, during these cultural um, events. Um, number four, it's to retool these cultural practices so that the focus is not on toxic masculinity and rather a balanced and shared view on gender equality and the role that men play in creating violent free communities. Um, number five is continuing using cultural practices such as the reed dance in Eswatini, um, which is formerly Swaziland, for younger women and older women, because we've got two read dances in Swaziland, one for the younger ladies and then one for the older women. But it's using these practices to promote women um, as jewels to be treasured and not abused, instead of using them to the satisfaction of the male gaze where they are seen or the read dance, you know, is seen as a place where you can just go and view women. Um, that's not why these cultural practices exist and, you know, moving away or educating, um, excuse me, educating, you know, the public on these um, and the importance of them um, is very, very important as well. And then lastly, it would then be capacitating traditional leaders so that they can be able to deal with gender-based um, violence cases on merit and not based on their personal values and attitude. Um, Princess, I'd like to say thank you very much um, for the opportunity to be able to present to you. And thank you as well to um, Princess Stella as well as Curtin. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to Princess Palenque. Um, I, I put it, what particularly stood out for me is how we can now use um, our traditional events, but especially those which are meant for men, to spread the word, to use them as an, a platform to educate men on gender-based violence, to make, um, there's a comment from Princess Tepi, that is a very important, uh, let me just read a comment from Princess Tepi, excuse me, sorry. Princess Tepi says, that is a very important piece of information on educating the public on the read dance. Um, it also relates to what I was saying that um, these traditional events are see, they, they tend to have a bit of stigma around them. Like for example, read dance would be seen as an opportunity to go and view women. But if we use them in the, to, as a platform to educate people, then it can really make a big impact. Thank you so much, Princess Palenque. Um, now our next speaker has 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 his bio is quite 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 extensive. I will try um, my best to introduce him as well as I can. His Royal Highness Prince Burns Ngamashe is a prince of Amakwali in the Khakhabe Kingdom. Prince Burns is a teacher by profession. He joined the Eastern Cape House of Traditional Leaders in 1996 at its inception and later became a member of the then National Council of Traditional Leaders in 1997, which has later become the National House of Traditional Leaders. In the year 2002, he was nominated as the deputy chairperson of the Eastern Cape 
provincial house of traditional leaders. And he was nominated for three consecutive terms until 2017, when he formally opted to leave the house after the end of the term. He has been a member of the National Executive Committee of the Congress of the Traditional Leaders of SA, known as Contralesa, and it's national and has been its national organizer. He has represented South Africa in SADC Council of Traditional Leaders for two consecutive terms. He has participated in a number of conferences and forums representing the institution of traditional leadership. Among others, he has represented us in Ghana, in Botswana, in Uganda, in Zambia, in Malaysia, in the United States of America, Ohio, in Argentina, in Chile, in the UK, and in Germany. He has been the spokesperson and advisor to both the late His Majesty, King Zanesi Zwe Sandile, and the Regent Queen Mother, Her Majesty Queen Mother Noloiso Sandile, and is now the current advisor and spokesperson to the current King and Monarch of the Khachabe Kingdom, His Majesty King Jongu Polo Sandile. Prince Burns has served in the public in public entities as a board member and played advisory services to the Ministry of Corporate Governance and Traditional Affairs, as well as the Ministry of Water and Sanitation. He is currently a member of parliament in the National Assembly of the, South, the Republic of South Africa. We welcome you, Prince Burns. The floor is yours. Thank you. <coughs> uh, thank you very much, uh, Princess. Uh, for such uh, a warm introduction, which might raise uh, expectations uh, to your listenership. Um, let me greet all the panelists, as well as uh, participants, uh, fellow uh, participants, listeners, and viewers, we are called upon this webinar session at a time when I am part of a parliamentary portfolio committee fact finding mission to assess the unprecedented damage. South Africa has ever endured since the episode of Nongause in the mid of the 19th century. The acts of insurrection in pursuit of economic sabotage have posed serious economic challenges which aggravated those inflicted by the pandemic. We, however, find solace and comfort in the ability of His Excellency President Cyril Ramaphosa in navigating the muddy waters towards economic recovery, political stability, and policy certainty in times of despair and nauseous apathy. Indeed, this is a very important milestone as, a, as an organic initiative by our own royalty in South Africa and the continent to ignite a debate that confronts the issues of women and gender imbalances. This webinar therefore comes at a time when the question of women emancipation is high in the agenda of transformation towards the consideration of African uni consolidation of African unity and advancement of global citizenry. The colonial invasion to give the context and its assault epochs to the indigenous peoples of Africa, particularly the ferocious and orchestrated execution of a determined program aimed at total decimation and obliteration of African indigenous communities and their leadership institutions 
remains the barometer against which to measure the extent of social disintegration, which affected women the most. Such a colonial predatory subjugation of the continent led to the chronic paralysis of our indigenous institutions and systems, which subjected our leadership to the jaws of overdependence, especially on the state machinery. Thus, this topic comes at a time when the need to re-engineer the fortitude of our forebears and invoke their inspiration to soldier on in the reaffirmation of the African personality and humanity, which respects and honor the cardinal role played by women in shaping the character of every nation's soul. Let us invigorate the spirit of those gallant martyrs who remain the trailblazers of our revolutionary morality to intensify our zealous cause and never capitulate to the steadfast mission to create deliberate measures which place women as catalysts and midwives of stability, peace, and prosperity in the evolution of every nation's progress. In this regard, the illustrious generational tapestry of women of substance, like Princess Emma Sandy, who against all odds became the first woman to gain formal education in the sub-Saharan Africa, and deed of ownership of land in her own right, not as inheritance, but the first generation owner. We also have Queen Asantewa, the queen mother of Ejisu in Ghana, who led and inspired Ashanti chiefs to take up arms against the British in defense of the golden stool. According to Karen Magji, she led an army of about 4,000 men to fight against exploitation by the British. Indeed, the current of women must emulate the current mantatis of Batrogwa and King Motaha, left a footprint of being known as the most feared women military and political leaders of the early 19th century. The continent of Africa is endowed with rich heritage and epic struggles, searched and uncovered, like the story of Queen Nonesi of Abatim, who was a Pondo princess and occupied the regency of Abatim twice. The contemporary heroines of our struggle for liberation, like Charlotte Maclege, Lillian Ngoyi, and many other unsung heroines derived their source of inspiration from these pioneers of bravery who were at the cold face of colonial subjugation and apartheid tyranny. As we now navigate the legislative regime in our democratic dispensation to locate the role of women as well as institutional capabilities in place to mitigate the gender disparities and toxic masculinity, 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 which feeds into undesirable consequences of abuse and domestic violence. We need to invest in human capital in ways that are deliberate and conscious. The constitution of the Republic of South Africa creates measures and mechanisms to ensure the role of women in leadership positions within the institution of traditional leadership, as well as practical expression in all the institutions seized with the responsibility to protect our democracy at the level of the executive, legislative, judiciary, as well as chapter nine institutions. 
Once again, it is work in progress, which must be replicated in each and every country of our continent, including multilateral institutions like AU, SADC, statutory and non-statutory structures. It is the current generation of women who must carry the task of sharpening all our policy and legislative instruments so as to level the playing field for sustainable, equitable share of women in matters of influence and governance. There is a trajectory that will define the manner in which future generations of young women will characterize the current generation either as heroines of substance whose indomitable landmark footsteps shall be engraved in the annals of historical victory or, or treacherous traitors who betrayed the course of history and deserve nothing but knowing in the shame of hopelessness. Fellow princesses and members of our esteemed royalty, you have the lignine and the adrenaline to carry this task to its logical conclusion without fail. I therefore implore your courage to, re to rise to the occasion and contribute in building a society where men and women live in harmony in the comfort of enjoying equal opportunities based on the universal human rights culture and milieu. I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prince Burns. Touching on a number of issues amongst them, the pioneers of bravery, Abu Mama Charlotte Matreke, and um, he asked a very important question: Are we going to be the her are we going to be heroines heroines of substance, or are we going to be treacherous traitors, betraying the cause of history? Thank you very much, Prince Burns. Very very informative um, speech that he gave. Uh, thank you very much for making time to join this webinar. Um, we greatly, greatly appreciate you taking time off your busy schedule to be with us. And that goes to everyone else today. Thank you very much for making it today. Um, we will now Thank move you. on to... Pardon? I think he was saying, okay. I think he was saying thank you. Thank you, Prince Burns. Speaker number four coming up, we have Miss Verena Gothia. I hope I pronounced it right. She is a gender and culture activist. She is the founder of Impulse Interactive, which is an organization based in Switzerland. She will tackle um, gender-based violence, sharing a, her perspective from a Swiss or rather Switzerland experience. She has worked with various communities globally, including the Luanglo Bomvu, um, royal family and colonial and, and, and um, council. Sorry, she worked with the Luanlolu Bonvu royal family as well as their council in the Mbondo kingdom, including um, working on youth and culture development and on child and women abuse and empowerment. Miss Verena, thank you very much for joining us. We are happy to have you. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Yes, I send my greetings from Switzerland. You can see the mountains. Uh, actually, I have summer here in Switzerland and I bring you hopefully some sun um, because you have winter. Um, thank you for the invitation, um, uh, Royal Highnesses, diplomats and all your participants. Um, I'm very happy to be here and this invitation took me by surprise. Um, yes, and it's a great honor to be here and thank you very much, especially Stella Sitrau, uh, because she's the one who brought me here. We know each other for a very long time. We have been working together. What we did in Tabunkulu uh, will be part of them, what I'm going to tell you. Um, I'm living in Switzerland and some people might think that we don't have those um, problems and gender-based uh, uh, violence, but actually do, we do have it as well. Um, 
I don't know if you know um, how we uh, are in Switzerland as, as a, a democracy. Uh, a lot of people think that we are actually the oldest democracy in the world. Um, Switzerland was built in um, 1291, um, 730 years ago. But uh, actually, as a democracy as we are now, it uh, was built in 1848. And this means uh, this is 133 years are we old as a democracy this way. And by this time then, all men received the right to vote. Yeah, I say all men, because the women, they were not uh, allowed to vote to this time. And uh, they received actually, or we as women, actually all Swiss, Swiss women uh, received the right to vote exactly 50 years ago. This means my mother was not uh, allowed to vote and um, she, she was um, like uh, all other women uh, in Switzerland, like a person from second class. Why do I tell you this? Uh, because I think this is a major reason why um, gender-based um, violence uh, has, a, has a floor, has a basic to be. Uh, our hundred years, Swiss women fought for their right to be part of this democracy. And uh, finally, 50 years ago, they, um, they could go and vote and be elected. It was not so long ago that uh, women were uh, human beings uh, without a lot of rights, without a lot of rights. Not the right to have a job without the permission uh, of her husband. Uh, a lot of women were not allowed to go out for work. Not the right to buy a car, uh, to wash, uh, buy a washing machine, to hire a flat without his permission and not allowed to study in many faculties. Women, women were regarded as lower human beings with less because they were thought to have less intellectual potential to reflect and make decisions. I remember some interviews that they brought now to this 50 years um, celebration. And I heard some women and men who said they are not good to, uh, to, to make to vote um, because they are not in, in, uh, in a shape to make decisions because they have not the intellectuality of a man. So um, not all men were thinking as though. My father was not this way and my mother was very emancipated. But without him um, permitting it, she would never had the chance to work and to do what she wanted to do. But somehow she was my role model. And that's why I think what uh, I heard uh, just before, role models are so, so important. Um, boys and girls, they need those role models um, and this uh, to, to, to see that women and men are equal and in a just natural way as it is. Yeah, um, this is where we from Switzerland come from. I think it's important that you know that. So um, even though we have different traditional uh, ways uh, where we come from, but the patriarchy is uh, something that brought us where we are even in this issue. Yeah. So women's rights is one of the big issues, even now today. Our society in Switzerland um, is to 25% uh, uh, coming from people from all over the world. So also these um, upbringings and traditions, they flow in into our um, society. So I think change must be done in the heads of all because what we um, what we are educated is very deep in our genes, in our heads, men and women, and thus it doesn't go very fast, you know, because it's very very deep in our ourselves and just uh, the society must change, and I think we are 
here on a good way. And um, I thank you very much for this invitation because I really think it's a global issue to, to tackle with uh, gender-based violence. Um, I have uh, looked uh, some figures about um, gender-based violence in Switzerland. And um, talking about 2020, we see that all offenses of violence are mainly suffered by women and children in Switzerland. Even talking about children, there are more offenses towards girls. We are a small country. We have 8.5 million inhabitants. This is versus South Africa with 50 um, millions more. Um, it's very small. And our figures seem to be very small in your eyes, but for us it's significant. And each case is one case too much. In 2020, 21 women, seven of them were girls from zero to age 14, have been killed mainly of the hands of their beloved ones. To compare seven men, three of them were boys under the age between zero and 17. Talking about rape, we have the same picture. Zero male and 20, uh, 256 female victims. 37 of these victims were girls of the age between zero and 17. These are figures of cases reported to the police, knowing that much more victims never report the crime of rape and sexual abuse out of fear, the fear not to be taken serious or the fear to damage the image of the family or even to protect the offender. So many of the victims even blame themselves for what happened or are blamed by their family. So how do we deal in Switzerland with that issue? We have shelters for women in our big cities where they can stay with their children for some time and receive professional assistance. The places are secret. There is just a number, an official number. And um, because uh, it happens, uh, unfortunately, from time to time um, that um, the offenders find their, their uh, uh, wife uh, and children and even kill them because they have left. We have advice centers where they can physic, uh, psychological and social and legal advice and assistance. Um, they can assist women also to go to court. Um, and this is uh, financed by, um, by Switzerland, by, um, by the government, because this is very important that only, not only the, the rich uh, have the right to write to get their rights, uh, also uh, all, all the other women. And um, yeah, there is, there is a, inequality often in, in question of money because also in Switzerland, uh, women uh, usually um, stay at home or just wake for uh, work for some uh, percentage because they can look for the children. And it means they don't have the big money. The big money usually is uh, with the man. So where the money is, is also the power. And this is a problem when you have to go um, uh, for to go court. Um, if you don't have the money, you need this assistance and this is well, uh, well organized in Switzerland. And we work with children and parents at school to implement the value that each and every person has the right to determine over her or himself over the body and soul. This project is called My Body Belongs to Me. It's uh, just some words, but they mean something. And we work with children just on that. What does it mean when your body you, uh, belongs to you? Um, the project talks about the right to say no. Uh, if something or someone is offending him or her and um, uh, by the way, I want to say this is a project for girls and boys, because I think 
to know that every person has the right to say no, that uh, each and every person's body belong to themselves is also good to know for the boys. So they learn the respect. And this is uh, something both um, sexes must, must know. Children, children learn here what they like. So um, especially children who have been abused, they don't have the senses what they really like, what, they, what feels good and what feel, feels bad. Um, some children, they just have to train that. And uh, when I say children, it's also with um, women who have been raped. Um, they must learn uh, successfully as, uh, how does it feel when it's good and how does it feel when it's bad. And this is something we, we, we learn with the children. We teach them, uh, how does it feel when it's good? You, you feel it. You are the only one who knows when something is okay and you know when it's not okay. And if it's not okay, it's your personal right. Even though you are so small, to say, no, I don't like it. And fears are, uh, feelings are not to be discussed because no one else knows what is right or wrong for you. It's just yourself. So we, we give them, we empower them uh, to, to feel and to talk about that and to say no, if it's not okay. Um, then we talk about uh, to deal with secrets, especially uh, with, by, uh, with child abuse or uh, sexual abuse with women, uh, secrets are a great issue, especially when in, it happens in a relationship. So we, we teach them um, secrets are uh, good when you feel good. But if a secret doesn't feel good, it's no secret, then you could tell it. Um, so uh, it, it, it makes the children free to tell somebody about abuse sexual abuse and um, don't do, uh, that they don't keep it for themselves. Um, it talks about the right to get help um, and uh, it shows where to get help uh, and, and assistance. And important here in this point is that there are uh, places where they can get help. There is actually a telephone number and we know that a lot of kids use this telephone number for a first step because um, this is somebody they don't know, they don't have to fear about um, their secrets, they still want to keep. Um, but this is very important that the kids um, have a place to go. Um, actually, we are working with teachers and we are working with um, schools and uh, even the teachers must be pre prepared that the child is coming and telling something and sometimes uh, we don't want to hear it because it's not comfortable but because we have to do something afterwards but we teach the, the teachers uh, what they could do and where to go so um, the children are not left alone Working this way with the children, uh, we implement these basic human rights there uh, where even many adults don't know that they exist. Uh, there are still adults that think uh, children have not those rights and they are always the, uh, the people who know better uh, how the child could feel. But it's not true. Uh, very, even very little, little um, sorry, every uh, very little kid children can uh, can tell you if they want something or if they not. And I'm not talking about toys. I'm talking about feelings, about hurt, about uh, being screamed at. So we can teach the children very early age, uh, and and they know what they like. Part of the program is to work with the children using uh, an interactive exhibition. So we go with the children do this, uh, through this interactive exhibition in small groups and uh, work with them, but also to educate the parents uh, and, as I said, the teacher, because it's very, no uh, very important that the surrounding, the network knows how to deal with that when something comes up. Um, many times after I had the lectures for the adults, women come to me to tell me how grateful they are to see how we inform the children 
because they would have loved to have this kind of assistance during their own childhood, being a victim of sexual abuse. These are the moments uh, I'm mostly very touched because I think we don't do it just for the kids. We also do it for the adults. And this is very important. So this is uh, one example. Um, we, we try to adopt uh, this uh, for um, Tabunkulu um, when we're working uh, around the traditional festival uh, of the Abampondos. And we, 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 yeah, we worked in this case with theater. This is something uh, I also use here in Switzerland, but we, we did it in 2011 in Tabunkulu. And um, we worked there on uh, child abuse and dom domestic violence at the traditional festival of the Amapontes and Tabankul, as I said. There we worked with interactive theater, means uh, a theater that, um, theater play uh, that involves the audience uh, in, a, in a, somehow. So um, we worked there with uh, kids, of a school and um, we supported them to um, develop scenes uh, of sexual abuse happening in their environment to create the story and to play them. And they performed the theater in front of the community and went into the interaction with the audience to find solutions uh, for situations of this kind. The method we used was very good adopted by the kids and showed that it worked very well to raise awareness and to make people find solutions for their own situations. These are two examples how we work actually and it really worked very well in South Africa. We had to give uh, 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 everything out of our hands. We taught them how to, how to make the, um, the facilitation because they did it in, uh, in their own language. So um, I think we all have a very, you want to say something? <laughs> yeah. Yes, please. Um, we love listening to all of this, but may we just kindly be mindful of time. So yeah. if you could just. I've come to the end. Uh, I thought when you come, I must finish, yeah. I think gender-based violence is something that uh, is very, very important globally. And uh, looking over the border to unite, unite in the fight again. Thank you very much. It's very important. And thank you for Hello. Thank you very much. I cannot hear you. Oh, are you done? Oh, all right. I was having trouble hearing you. Okay. I think I you just wanted to say um, it's very useful that we come together globally to work on that. And thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'm happy to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, Miss Verena. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, we have had to cut you a little short because of time, um, considering the fact that we still have quite a, a, a vast lineup of um, speakers. Um, she mentioned something that is so beautiful and so short, but straight to the point. Each case is one too much, regardless of a country's population. Thank you, Ms. Verena. And let us now just move straight into speaker number five. We have Mrs. Kabahawa Diakite. Um, she's an ambassador of Guinea to South Africa. I'm excited to hear what she will share, say, share because she will share on her country's experience in relations regarding culture and gender, as well as gender-based violence and legislation. Uh, Mrs. Kaba, um, you are welcome to take the floor. May we kindly just be mindful of time. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Unfortunately, uh, I am now Mrs. Hawa Kaba, Her Excellency. Uh, my name is Santu Dabo, and I am the first secretary here at the Embassy of the Republic of Guinea in charge of economic affairs. Uh, I'm representing my ambassador today as uh, she um, is out of the country currently. So um, 
It is such an honor to join each and every one of you today to discuss um, this amazing topic on women, culture, and tradition. I'd like to also seize the opportunity to salute the brave women of the Republic of South Africa who marched on August 9, 1956 against the apartheid um, regime. And at the same token, just to uh, wish a happy women month to each and every one. On my part today, I'd like to just bring your attention to um, a research that has been conducted since 2006 by the World Economic Forum on the global gender, um, gender gap to measure the extent of gender-based gap amongst um, four key dimensions. One being the economic per, uh, participation and opportunity, educational attainment, health and social, and then political empowerment. In their findings in 2020, uh, the, the World Economic Forum found that, that the average distance completed to party is at 68.6%. Uh, this is an improvement since the last time they did this study. However, it is still about a 30, 31.4% gap that remains to be uh, closed globally. Uh, I'm talking globally because gender, the gender-based gap is not just something as we've heard from our previous speaker, is something that is a global phenomenon. It's not <clears throat> particular to one country or one continent. It seems to be like a phenomenon that is hitting the entire world. Uh, <clears throat> the largest gender disparity is once again in the political empowerment gap. And um, it, even though that has been improved, yeah. But the, the gap is still um, very large. And that is the one part that is um, that remains, it, it, though there's changes, but the, the pace of it is very slow. And then we have the second largest economic, um, the second largest gap is on economic participation and opportunity uh, for women, which is at only 57.8%. And um, that, that also gives you between men and women globally is about a 40% gap when it comes to economic empowerment. Uh, the report also mentioned in its finding that many country, uh, that in many countries women are significant, significantly disadvantaged in accessing credit, land, and financial product, which prevent op opportunities for them to start a company or make a living for themselves. I think that. Um, based on so many or uh, all of the previous presenters we can all attest to that, that this is a global phenomenon because women are definitely um the bottom of the pot when it comes to obtaining like credit or lands or uh just uh, to better themselves and um the research definitely can testify to that um as far as the top five most improved countries in the world this year, uh, we have Ethiopia, Spain, Mali, and Mexico. Um, though there's progress, uh, there's definitely not one single country in the world that has actually achieved gender parity. Um, so the gap in all the countries in the world does exist. Um, out of the top 10 countries, only one country in Sub-Saharan um, Africa is part of it, which is Rwanda that came in at number nine. The Republic of Guinea is, however, amongst the top 10 best performer by closing its economic participation gap by 80.3%. So in Guinea, what's happening is that during this, um, with the current president, what we're, one of the main focus is um, women empowerment and youth empowerment. Hence, um, <clears throat> they're, you find a lot of women in that you find like the government on ongoing campaign to elect more women in strategic political um, positions. And um, there are more women in government offices and part partaking in major country advantage decisions. However, that being said, there are many things that remain true against women despite official effort. 
um, culture, just like um, all the previous presenters. Uh, we have culture issues, gender-based violence, um, still FGM, um, education that are still issues um, in our country. Guinea is faced by early marriages um, for women, child abuse, as well as um, uh, social and family pressure. Social and family pressure tends to be one of the major issues in Guinea um, because in usually in marriages, the women are usually pressured to stay or other than that, they stigmatize when they do choose to uh, <clears throat> leave that the, the, the abuse, the abusive relationships and so on. Um, since the COVID also locked down there have been uh, cases of rape. There have been recent cases of rape in um, in Guinea. Though they've been um, ongoing, um, um, they've been ongoing uh, uh, cases to actually uh, help out this situation. Women, such as you find that during the time of the COVID, there have been a lot of online support group for women that are actually exposing several many cases of. Um, rape and gender-based violence is actually forcing the hands of the authorities to take actions against these perpetrators. So that is a good thing. There's also um, a lot of NGO involvement in Guinea to help out women as well. Um, and similar to South Africa, uh, I think I was very, um, I, I would say moved by hearing about the uh, virginity testing. I'm not sure uh, how that works here, hopefully um, you will be able to enlighten me on that. But there's similar things in Guinea uh, that happens as well, which is, uh, I won't call it virginity testing, but usually when a woman gets married, um, a young girl, they, it's a cultural practice where the night of your, uh, the first night with your husband, there's usually older women sitting outside your front door to find out whether or not you are you were a virgin or not. And uh, if it is, if you are, then that's a big celebration. But if you're not, then, you know, it is announced that you are not. So that plays a, a significant um, role in the minds of women, especially in the world that we live in today. So as far as what we can do um, together, I, I think that uh, it is no secret that women are the backbone of any nation, but we are strongly overlooked in major decision making. Um, so we would definitely need to work hand in hand to empower more women, as well as um, <clears throat> advocate for women and, um, you know, the, the allow conversations to take place. You know, I've listened to all of you guys earlier um, today, and I think we all, come to the same conclusion that we need to advocate. We need to talk a little, to talk more and more about um, gender-based violence and gender parity and fairness, equality between uh, male, and, male and female, and also educate our children from a young age. Um, so I thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to uh, more comments and more, I, I, I guess, in-depth presentation from the file from the next participant. Thank you. Thank you to Ms. Santo Dabo, all the way from Guinea. She touched on very, very important topics as well. She mentioned that women have limited access to credit, land, and financial products. And I think we have similar issues across our borders and continents. Um, in the sense that dependency of females on males tends to fuel the fire of gender-based violence. If you are a woman and you have limited access to, to, to resources and products that can help you be independent, then you have no choice, very limited choice, um, little choice, but to depend on a man for provision and security. And that really, really um, adds fuel to the fire. So thank you so much, Ms. Dabo. Thank you so, so much. Next, we have Ms. Sonja Kope. And she is the Deputy High Commissioner of Australia to South Africa. She will also be sharing on her country's experience on culture and gender 
on gender-based violence and on legislation. Um, over to you, Ms. Sonja. Uh, thank you very much for having me as part of the panel today and for giving me the opportunity to talk a little about this incredibly important topic. I'm ahead of Women's Day on Monday. It's a fitting time to discuss gender-based violence, but we shouldn't limit our conversations to just this day or even this month. If we're to make a difference, then we need to be aware of the effects of violence and abuse all year round. Um, we know violence against women and girls is a serious issue at any time, but particularly now during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Self-isolation and quarantine, economic stress, childcare and homeschooling responsibilities all compound the risk of violence and also reduce access to support services. The Georgetown Institute ranks Australia and South Africa at 22 and 66 respectively on the Women, Peace and Security Index. While that measures more than just violence against women, it represents women's well-being by ranking three indicators, inclusion in economic, social and political life, justice through both formal laws and informal discrimination, and security at the individual, community and societal levels. What we see from this ranking is that while both our countries can celebrate successes, we also acknowledge challenges and areas that we can address. We know too that statistics are affected by underreporting and that violence and discrimination disproportionately affect low socioeconomic and marginalised groups. I'd like to, to share with the group some sobering statistics um, from my own country, Australia. In Australia, one in three women has experienced physical or sexual abuse, which I believe reflects the global average that one of our earlier speakers referred to. In our immediate region of the Southwest Pacific, that figure rises to an horrific 68% of women and to Australia's immediate north in Southeast Asia, the figure stands at 40% of women. Australian women are nearly three times more likely to experience violence from an intimate partner than men are. Women with disabilities in Australia are twice as likely to experience sexual violence or intimate partner violence as those without a disability. Australia's Indigenous, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women experience higher rates of physical and intimate partner violence than non-Indigenous women and are 34 times more likely to be hospitalised due to family violence than non-Indigenous women in Australia. Young women aged 18 to 24 experience significantly higher rates of physical and sexual violence compared with women in older age groups. And while we lack comprehensive data on violent experiences by LGBTIQ people, one study has found that lesbian, bisexual and heteroflexible women are at least twice as likely to experience physical violence by a partner than heterosexual cisgendered women. And some attitudes among the general community in Australia are disturbing. One in five Australians believe that many actions that constitute domestic violence are so-called normal reactions to day-to-day -to -day stress and frustration. And two in five Australians believe women make up false reports of sexual assault as a way to punish men. To respond to all this, Australia is implementing its second national plan to reduce violence against women and children and has committed 1.1 billion Australian dollars to improve women's safety. This will fund measures focused on preventing violence before it begins, delivering frontline and response services, providing financial support for women leaving a violent relationship understanding the issues through data collection and monitoring, and expanding responses through the criminal justice system. It also includes increased support for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and children, measures to improve the online environment for women and children, and additional support for women from diverse communities. In providing these services, the Australian government pays attention to what we call the cultural safety 
of such services. And it includes support for migrant and refugee women with a particular focus on economic and social inclusion. The Australian government provides culturally sensitive training on respectful relationships. Nor have we forgotten about support for men, especially for those at risk of using violence. We have programs aimed at helping men change their behaviour. Here in South Africa, how we can contribute to women's empowerment is the focus of the Australian High Commission's development assistance, our advocacy and our day-to-day -day work. We have supported a range of programs from mentoring programs in school to providing menstrual pads for girls at schools in townships and improving women's access to land rights. In the international sphere, we advocate for a strong focus on addressing violence against women and girls as part of the global COVID-19 response. At the Human Rights Council, we co-led a joint statement on family violence, and we have co-sponsored resolutions in the past year on the elimination of discrimination against women and girls and on the elimination of female genital mutilation. Amongst the programs, research and funding though, we must also take responsibility at a personal level. As a mother of three children, a teenage girl and two young adult boys, it is my strong belief that combating gender-based violence starts by raising good boys. This means raising the kind of men who respect women, who step in when they see unacceptable behavior and who call out sexist and derogatory remarks by their friends. An Australian television advertisement from a few years ago depicts this well. It shows a young boy slamming a door on a young girl, causing her to fall over. Her mother explains to her, he just did it because he likes you. In another scene, a father at a picnic yells to his son, don't throw like a girl, a very good example of what we call toxic masculinity. The scenes in the advertisement escalate until we see a woman being knocked to the ground by an angry and violent partner. The message I think is clear, small acts that we dismiss as boys being boys or we make excuses for directly lead to more serious acts of violence, perhaps not in all cases, but in enough for us to be concerned. And so that is my challenge for this Women's Month, to make a small change in our behaviour or that of our families to stop the escalation of violence. The small changes we can make in our own lives can make a real difference to the number of women who are victims of gender-based violence. Thank you very much. Thank you. Combating gender violence starts with raising good men. That, that just stood out. And it's very interesting to hear that 1.1 billion Australian dollars has been invested to improving women's safety. I wonder how much we're spending in South Africa. Thank you very much, Ms. Sonja. Thank you so much. Very well um, researched, very informative statistics that you shared with us. Thank you so, so much. And um, let's just um, move on to our next speaker. We have Dr. Sremol Fernando. Um, he is from the Diplomatic Society, Inter-Regional Advisor and he will be speaking on the role of women from a Sri Lankan perspective. So that's another international perspective. Welcome, Dr. Fernando, the stage is yours. Thank you. Um, Dr. Srimal, are you with us? Is Dr. Srimal with us? Oh, okay, okay. Thank you very much, Princess. Uh, can you hear Pleasure. me? Yeah. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay. Uh, so good evening and greetings from Colombo. Okay. Uh, Royal Highnesses, uh, Princesses, ladies and gentlemen, and the Diplomatic Society, the South African uh, Princesses Network. Thank you so much for inviting me. Well, uh, before I commence my little speech on this session, I would like you to take as to a few clips from Sri Lanka, as well as uh, about economic empowerment, cultural empowerment, and about politics. This will cover that. Uh, Anisha, can you uh, take me through these three clips that I shared with you? Hello. Uh, 
Hello. Hi, Shimu, we just trying to play. Okay, right. Just play the three clips, please. Oh, here we go. Okay. Uh, this is from the Sri Lankan diaspora, how women play a role. Okay, just, I don't, I can't hear the, okay, you can go through it. Uh, can you, we can't hear the sounds. Can you unmute the sound? Kirtan, the sound is not there. Okay. It's, uh, we're trying, we'll just see. Maybe you can talk us through it. Okay. Um, so uh, these wait, wait, are a few women leaders from the Sri Lankan 3.5 million diaspora community who have emerged as leaders in Italy, Norway, and uh, in uh, New York, as well as in New Zealand. This lady, Hansi Gunratan, is the deputy mayor of Oslo. Okay, there are about 50,000 Sri Lankans living there. This is uh, Venusha Walters from New Zealand. She's from the uh, Sri Lankan parliament. These are few political leaders who have uh, brought the Sri Lankan image into the global arena, right? So I wish it, uh, okay. Similarly, uh, we have male uh, leaders also in Canada and all. And what I'm trying to uh, take you through is about uh, one is a country perspective and one is a South Asian perspective about women le women's leadership as well as their contribution to the region as well as to our country. And uh, I will speak a little bit about uh, domestic violence also uh, after, the, after the clips and after a few points. This is about culture because th these are important facts that contribute to a society, okay? So with that, uh, this one minute clip ends on diaspora. I mean, I will go to a little bit on uh, culture for you to understand a little bit about the cu cultural contribution. I hope at least you can hear my voice even. Kirchen, can you hear my? Yes, yes, yeah, we can hear yeah. you. Oh. It's just the, the video sound is not coming on, but please, you can explain it as it goes. Yeah. So Thank you. Uh, the, these are the types of uh, dancers from Sri Lanka. One, uh, one particular dance is called Kendian dance. The other one is choreography with fusion. It's fusion dancing means it's a dance for, coming from various provinces of Sri Lanka from north, south, and how these things bring about coexistence and peace. These are important facts on a time when uh, Sri Lanka is exper experiencing a post-war conflict period where there was violence for 30 years. Now people are contributing to a progressive society. But history plays a role, culture plays a role, sociology plays a role, and also economics plays a role. The next point is, the uh, next clip is about uh, the world's first female uh, prime minister who uh, called Mrs. Honorable uh, Sirimabo Bandaranaike, who was a very close associate of uh, President Nelson Mandela of South Africa. She, uh, her contribution to Sri Lanka being a small island in the last 70 years is uh, to take a non-alignment path. Uh, where it, uh, the, uh, as a small nation, it didn't take sides during the Cold War. So uh, being close to the nearest neighbor, India, as well as other important superior nations like China, US, and even the African uh, developing nations, she created an enormous contribution in shaping the or manifestation of the new foreign policy diplomacy. So this is about uh, my country's uh, uh, socio-economic and political spheres, how it has evolved and all. Now, uh, let me, uh, with this ending of this video clip, Today, I will like to uh, cover a few major points from South Asia as well as from uh, Sri Lanka. What are those things? Economic empowerment, women's uh, leadership and uh, political participation in the region. What, how, what is the percentage of uh, political participation uh, in, uh, in South Asia? It's around, uh, when it comes to ministerial profiles, uh, it's about 10% of the 
Uh, about 10% contribution comes from women uh, when it comes to the parliamentary. In, uh, you can hear me, right? Yeah. As, hello. Yeah. Yes, so, we can hear. Yeah, uh, so um, so uh, that's one. So when it, when, I, when I go a little bit further, let me speak about the regional superpower that is India. India's uh, first woman prime minister, the fourth prime minister was Mrs. Indira Gandhi, right? Uh, she says, "My father was a statesman, and I am a political woman. Uh, uh, my father was a saint, but I am not right with that." What was her contribution? She was the, when India gained independence, uh, the party was formed, uh, the first political party was uh, uh, India National Congress. And uh, her father, Jawaharlal Nehru, was the first prime minister and uh, the, the first prime minister of India. And India's uh, influence was there on the seven nations, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, India, Nepal, and all. So India's manifestation, uh, when it comes to women as well as men was an important part. Um, so India's women have a share of 10% in the mainstream politics. It's about uh, 10 to 11%. Then, uh, because politics plays the key in uh, drafting the constitution and the well-being of the nation in the last seven, seven years. India's examples have been followed by the rest of the nations like Sri Lanka. And uh, India was the largest democracy in, in our region. And its, con uh, its connections with Africa and beyond that has been, I mean, you know about it, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, Indra, uh, uh, um, Nelson Mandela, are key people who contributed to human rights. So let me go a little bit further. There are other women leaders from our region. Benasir Bhutto was the first uh, prime minister uh, and a uh, prime minister from a democratically elected Muslim nation. And there was Sikh Hasina from uh, Bangladesh, um, uh, who was the, who was, who's currently the longest serving prime minister and even Begum Kalidasya from Bangladesh um, was the first women's prime minister in the second largest Muslim state in, our, uh, in, in the world. So the contribution of women leaders in our region from starting from the world's first prime minister, Mrs. Sirimao Bandaranaika, to Benasir Bhutto, Indira Gandhi, and uh, Sheikh Hasina, and Kalidasya have contributed enormously. So from politics, let's go a little bit further into economics. When it comes to economics, near, uh, over 30% of uh, the subcontinent population's uh, contribution to economics comes from uh, women. So it's a very important manifestation. Then uh, let me go a little bit down to South, South and to my country, Sri Lanka. So in the Sri Lankan parliament, there are 12 MPs out of 225 uh, parliamentarians, which is a very small, significant population. And also um, uh, women's labor uh, participation in Sri Lanka's economic growth is about 30%. An unemployment rate of uh, Sri Lankan women is 36% out of this uh, 20 million population in a small island, uh, geographically positioned in the Indian Ocean, right? Uh, nearly uh, 600,000 uh, are employed, uh, 600,000 ladies are employed in the textile and the apparel industries. And another half a million are employed in the Ceylon tea plantation industry. Uh, Ceylon tea uh, exports to the globe is about 1.5 billion US dollars. Imagine six, uh, nearly 600,000 uh, employees, women employees pluck tea each day for the last 70 years. They have contributed to the national GDP and also the uh, ladies who are in the apparel sector. However, um, uh, there's a little bit of uh, challenges to this. The, uh, one of the surveys done according to the women's well-being survey, 47% of women felt men are superior to uh, men, women in Sri Lanka. This is a survey done in Sri Lanka. And another 35% of women in Sri Lanka agreed men can have good reasons to hit a woman uh, of their wives, right? So these are well-known uh, when it comes to uh, women's violence, gender inequality, 
these are things, but their contribution to the national GDP, GDP and for the economic growth is beyond words. This is the same case when it comes to India. They call Mata, right? Mata means mother, right? Mother India. So all this is referred to a lady, right? Lady who brings the children, right? So uh, in our culture, when it comes to Hinduism, Buddhism, and our civilization in South Asia, mother, the ladies play an important role. And still it is manifested in, a, in even in our economy, socio, socio-economic manifestation, but still politics needs to go further, like in Norway and Finland or in Scandinavia, the, the women's political participation is quite great. These are important things to bring gender equality in our region. I believe, and I heard a lot of uh, informative information from the princesses from South Africa. There's a lot to learn because our cultures are so close. Asia and Africa, we have close cultural bonds. And also I heard from some European and uh, Swiss, Swiss uh, gender specialists giving insights. And I, as a mother, I heard the Australian Deputy High Commissioner giving valuable insights into child's growth as a mother, mother how she, she's, uh, she's relating to her country's uh, gender, uh, gender progress as well as to family life. So these are things that are contributing as a, as a society. And I believe the, with limited time, what I brought you into this forum, some, some information will be helpful to further uh, structure and restructure and reshape the future progress for women in our world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sremao Fernando, all the way from Sri Lanka. Thank yes. you so, so much. That was very informative. We de definitely learned a lot. Thank you so much. Um, we will now move on to our next speaker. Um, she's a gender activist and gender-based violence survivor, Miss Josina Michelle. She's the founder of Kushuka Movement. This is an NPO, a nonprofit initiative that bridges the gap between giving a voice to women survivors while providing them with a safe haven in their time of need. Um, Ms. Michelle is a member of the UN and the EU Civil Society National Reference Group for the Spotlight Initiative in Mozambique. She is a UNFPA celebrity spokesperson and serves on a number of international boards. Ms. Michelle will, will unpack gender-based violence and its impact on women, on children, and on the society at large. Thank you so much for joining us, Ms. Michelle. The, the, the platform is certainly yours. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Um, Your Royal Highnesses, um, uh, esteemed members of the diplomatic corps, the diplomatic um, organization that is hosting us today, and any other uh, esteemed guests, I'd like to thank you for having me today. Um, I'm not going to be very, very long. I think it, it, there's been enough um, being said about gender-based violence. What we absolutely need to remember here at all times is that gender-based violence is a crime. It's a crime against women. Gender-based violence is a crime against human beings. It stems from the fact that women and men are not regarded as the same in, same, in, in various societies. And so gender-based violence continues as something that is tolerated, something that is normalized, and something that is perpetuated. It is perpetuated, and I'm going to say something quite controversial, but it is perpetuated both by men who benefit from the various, um, from the oppression of women in general, but it's also important to recognize that gender-based violence is also perpetrated by women. Gender-based violence um, I don't mean to say perpetuated, but I mean also to say perpetrated and perpetuated. Because um, in societies like ours, with very strong patriarchal systems, women are socialized from very young age 
to give different values to the lives of themselves, to their own lives, and to lives of men. A woman's journey starts very early, a woman's negative journey, in fact, starts very early by the time she is born. Many of us in this, um, in this forum today, and a few, and many of the women also watching, will probably not remember, but their own birth may not have been as celebrated as the birth of their brothers and other men in the family. Because we know clearly here in South Africa, here in Africa, um, and in other parts of the world, the value that a baby girl has and the baby boy has is completely different. Many of us have been received, oh, it's a girl. <laughs> okay, oh, it's a girl. But when it's a boy, you know, the family comes over, the community comes over to celebrate the birth of one more boy. And that's where the issue of gender inequality starts. That's where the issue, the seeds for gender-based violence, for the continuation of gender-based violence are actually planted. Now, um, we are in 2021. Gender-based violence has been with us since the annals of history. Gender-based violence has been criminalized perhaps uh, for the past 20 years, around two decades, in some of our countries. There are still many countries in this world that do not criminalize discrimination. They don't discriminalize harassment. They don't discriminalize, they don't criminalize gender-based violence. But for those countries, for example, in which gender-based violence is criminalized, there are still many of us who actually still fuel that kind of, of behavior. Now, it does not make sense that um, we are in 2021, we are in the middle of an industrial revolution, of the fourth industrial revolution. We are in the middle of telecommunications and so many, as we call the I R um, revolution. And we still have issues of gender-based violence, discrimination of women and children, and those that are perceived as weak as something that is tolerated. Okay, where do we start? We need to start first as individuals. We need to decide each one of us, where do we sit in the issue of gender-based violence? There is no fence. Either you are pro, either you are against, or you perpetuate it through your silence, through lack of action. So all of us here, Today, I hope to raise the challenge that by the time we finish this conversation, you are able perhaps to decide in which part of the fence you are. And you're able to justify to yourself, you're able to justify to your family, you're able to justify to the community why you take that position. And this challenge is both for women and for men. Six years ago, I was I found myself in a situation where I was abused. I was beaten to a point where I immediately lost the sight of my right eye. And when I decided to scream, and I didn't just scream for my abuser to stop, but I screamed because I was hoping to have assistance from the people around, the people in the houses. It happened in a very diplomatic area, for example, of Maputo, in which I believe that if I screamed in Portuguese and in English, someone would at least respond and come to my assistance. That did not happen. Eventually, my abuser uh, put me back in the car where he had abused me and he took me to a hospital. I was bleeding profusely. When I get to the hospital, um, it took me six hours to basically be attend attended to. Only when my family arrived six hours later was I actually um, looked at properly and taken into the operating room and um, all the assistance, let's say, was given to me. Subsequently, when I decided to open my to the case against my abuser, 
I discovered that all news, all, all, all the documents in the hospital have disappeared. All the documents in the police, because I'd reported to the police, had disappeared. When I started the legal process, um, we had to submit the documents into court three times before we knew that it would not disappear. Now, this is in Mozambique at a time or at, uh, at a time or at a period uh, where there is enough recognition for the work of my parents um, and all freedom fighters. However, the issue of gender-based violence, which cuts across race, class, age, and so many other definitions of identity, the issue of gender-based violence and the silencing of, a, of, of victims of violence was so um, in the interplay that you would not, I would rather say, I was surprised to find myself with that kind of treatment. My option was, after having gone to the hospital time and time again, having to justify why I wanted and I needed my documents, I thought about the millions of women, the thousands of women who are as abused as myself and who simply want to have their story told, their story validated and justice done. If this could happen to someone like me, for example, what then happens? to Soho, what happens to Maria, what happens to so many other women every single day. And that is when I decided to take the torch and stand for the rights, the needs of victims and survivors of gender-based violence. Through that, I created the Kutluka movement, which means rebirth. And it is rebirth because it represents the process that a woman who has been abused emotionally, financially, physically, sexually, it represents the process of rebirth after she finds a voice, after she goes through a process of healing and she comes back into the world. What do we do? At this particular point, we have programs in which we address those big agents of change in our communities. And in this particular case, the reason I'm speaking today, it's because we are working with custodians of culture, with leaders of our communities, our traditional leaders, our traditional healers, the matrons of our society. And in this particular case, the princesses in our societies, the women to whom we look up to. And we're working to find solutions, practical solutions, Number one, to redefine, to create a new paradigm in terms of the influence when it comes to gender-based violence, in terms of providing support for victims who have been abused, in terms of creating caring societies so that number one, gender-based violence is not tolerated, and number two, for those that have already experienced, they are treated properly. And so, we do that in terms of our advocacy, in terms of our mitigation um, programs, we have two main programs. One is the provision of dignity packs. Many of us have found ourselves in hospitals and in, 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 in medical centers, for example, sorry, police centers, where we have no clothes, we are bleeding, we have nothing but only the flesh that we were able to run with basically. And so with the dignity packs, it's basically to say to women, we hear you, we are here, we support. It provides essential items for them to know, number one, what are their rights, what are their needs, and how to use them. It educates the women at that particular point to know that really, if she's been abused by a man, she's not forced to report to a man. If she has, if she is at a police station and she is telling her story, no policeman can actually change the language in which she tells her story. All that needs to be information that is available immediately at the first point of reporting. We later on do the journey of survivors of violence with the, with the circles of support, which are groups of women that come together on a voluntary basis to actually provide the space for women to share, 
and to learn about the life of victims and survivors. The tendency of our societies to think that one has been abused at a particular point and three months later down the line, the abuse has passed. The reality is that it creates long-term trauma. It creates um, many illnesses and it, of course, the way we face life again. So they need to be safe spaces where women do that. These are the kind of offers that we're providing and we would like to work with um, this particular network of the princesses of, of, of South Africa and hopefully it can be extended to the, to the network of princesses in Africa. But basically to say we need, you know, no culture is oppressive. No culture actually perpetrates gender-based violence or advocates for gender-based violence because our cultures are inherently good. It's about the perpetration. It's, it's about the continuation of life. It's about the continuation of the group. And the group cannot continue if it's crippled by the very, one, by, by the very ones that actually bring life. And so without wanting to take this further, I want to say that we, and I'm very happy that we to, here today having this conversation, just to re reiterate that we stand against gender-based violence. We stand for gender-based violence, free societies and societies that use our culture as vehicles of affirmation, of positive affirmation, and vehicles in which people can relate, they can identify, and they can be safe in. I thank you very much. Wow, 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 wow. Thank you so much, Ms. Michelle. You are doing amazing advocacy work. Thank you for sharing your story. You are empowering so many of us, and I see their comments. Let me just read a few comments with regards to uh, Ms. Michelle's presentation. Um, so we have Ms. Verena. Ms. Verena is all the way in Switzerland and she says, so touching and true. Thank you for sharing with us, Ms. Josina Michelle and the Diplomatic Society. Oh, this is something else, but thank you so much, Ms. Josina. Let me go back to my main screen. Excuse me. Thank you for that very beautiful presentation. You touched on so many topics about, for example, how the issue of gender-based violence cuts across race, it cuts across class, it cuts across age. And for someone um, from a, such a prominent family, we would have expected for you to get better services, but this really shows us that it really just cuts across different classes in society. And she also raised the challenge for everyone to decide, are you going to be pro gender-based violence or against it? And sometimes we do not realize, but by not speaking up, we are actually promoting gender-based violence. So thank you very much, Mr. Michelle. Um, we will go on to the next speaker now. Um, Her Royal Majesty Nkosigazi Nomandla Mklawuli. Nkosigazi Nomandla Mklawuli is the acting chairperson of the National House of Traditional Leaders of South Africa. Um, she's a senior traditional leader of Emma Lubini Traditional Council. Her Royal Majesty is the former chairperson of Imbumba Yama Kosigazi Akomkulu. She is our guest speaker who will dwell broadly on gender-based violence, sharing on what the National House of Traditional Leaders is doing to address gender-based violence. We welcome you, Her Royal Majesty. Uh, greetings uh, to the facilitator, Princess Lovato Mabalani, uh, Royal Highnesses, uh, uh, Princesses, uh, diplomas, participants, all guests and listeners. Thank you very much for inviting me to this webinar. I've been following you, princesses, uh, during your webinars. What I like about your webinars, it is not a platform for crying because I don't like a platform for crying. It is always a platform for solutions. That's why I'm here. 
Let's have a, just a few issues to take home as, as royal highnesses. Let me first say Happy Women's Month. Consider the following. As princesses, you are also the custodians of culture and customs. As we know that according to our constitution in South Africa, that is the main role which is given to traditional leaders, which means that you are also custodians of culture and customs. You are expected to protect the customs, to review them as you are doing now. So remember, as, as traditional leaders, we can't say, let's deal away with this custom without consulting the owners of the custom as you are expected to preserve Tartan's customs as traditional leaders. People regard you as their pillars of strength because you are from royal leadership. They're expecting you to come with solutions. And I know even in, in your communi communities, they even ask you to look for jobs for them. Even if you are not even working as a princess, because they rely on you. Let's also call, uh, look at what is different from each and every webinar we have, we have held. What is different? And also consider that we've got different cultures and dif different communities. It is not easy to criticize a particular culture without talking to those people who are practicing it. Culture belongs to the communities and the families. It doesn't belong to uh, organizations. It belongs to the families and also to the communities. Real leadership is not about being elected. It is hereditary. So when you are a royal leader or a, a traditional leader, you must know that it, you are not elected. I'll talk about it later. Let's not also focus on the negative side of cultures. Let's also look at the positive side when we are talking about culture, our cultures. I'm here today to present the role of traditional leaders in fight against gender-based violence. The institution of traditional leadership is a, a, a status and role according to customary law subject to the constitution is recognized in terms of section 211 and 212 of the constitution of the Republic of South Africa, Act 108 of 1996. The traditional leadership and governance framework act also of 2003 as amended Act 23 of 2009 provides for recognition of four levels of traditional leadership and establishment of structures of traditional leadership and functions. Let me talk about the women's structures in traditional leadership. Because we decided to have women's structures to deal with the issues of gender-based violence and other issues that affect women, like women development. Legislation that provides for establishment of traditional leadership structures further provides that women should constitute at least one third of membership at all level, that is all traditional councils, local houses, provincial houses, and national houses of traditional leaders so that they can be able to participate. It is there in our act. 
They wanted representation of women in governance structures of traditional leadership has been achieved across the country. These structures operate through the committees and each has one committee that is responsible for gender issues and other marginalized groups. Since the beginning of uh, uh, the year 2020, our society saw a rise in the rate Um, I think we have a network problem. Um, oh, she's back. The network is after of lockdown, we understand that a social challenge in other groups of our communities. These were magnified by the conditions of lockdown among family members and people who are love relationships. During the month of August, also known as Women's Month, webinars were held hosted by, hosted to focus on the fight against gender-based violence and femicide cases, which became the second pandemic taking the levels of women and girls, or the, the lives of women and girls of all ages from infants to elderly women. Women traditional leaders were invited to participate in dialogues. The other dialogue was about gender equality organized by, by the Ministry of Women, Youth and People with Disabilities under the theme, Generation Equality. Breaking the, 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 the circles of tradition for women economic freedom held in, in September, 2020 on Zoom. Women traditional leaders made submissions to the ministry in a clear voice. September is also known as Heritage Month. We're supposed to be talking about a wound. When using that month, we also promote the role of women. And we know that women are the ones who are leading in this uh, uh, preservation of cut and customs. But what we need to look also, women, if you are talking about Uzila, that is mourning, some of the practices there are forced by women, not by men. Issues of putting a big blanket and other things, those are, are, are forced by women, not men. I'm not told, women are not there when we are being covered by, uh, 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 with that blanket. It's us. When the in-laws like Amadodagas, like as, as you are princesses, you are forcing me to do this and this because this is your home as a girl. That is not done by Amadod, it's done by us. Women oppressing other women. So we are, are trying to deal with those issues. Traditional leaders uh, uh, institution is recognized as a custodian of culture and traditional custom. The institution recognizes women as primary drivers and preservation of protect and protection of this uh, promotion of culture. That's what I was talking about. As we had that uh, uh, that uh, uh, con uh, uh, webinar, here were the clear resolutions. to review obstacles in cultural practices. The webinar assigned the committee, the committee on Heritage, Culture and Customs to lead research and work towards the review of cultural practices and customs that are viewed as absolute and infringed on human rights. The intention is to align them with the provision of the Bill of Rights in the constitution. Cultural practices specifically mentioned included when Ubutwala, that is abduction of, of children for marriage, 
ukungena hlatwa dirope death morning periods where where, where a, 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 a wife is is expected to mourn and uh, for such a long time but when it is a, a, a husband who has lost a, 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 a wife that is not happening but we'll be dealing with those issues talking to the communities as we have said that we will need have to talk to the communities before dealing with those issues resolution number two was about land ownership there is currently a challenge of land ownership by women in the areas of traditional leadership through this it is not happening in all communities women are prohibited to inherit or own land in their capacities in some areas I think we're experiencing another network issue. Nkosikazi Nomandla. Can you hear us? The matter and address it with Can you hear me now? Can you yes, ma'am, we can hear you now. Yes, ma'am. Can, can we hear you? Yes, you lost me. I, I, I think know. it's the network issue. Okay. Uh, Mama, me... if you could just, um, sorry, Mama, if you could just repeat uh, maybe two or three lines before you got cut. Thank you. All right. But I was, uh, let me just go to, 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 let me just go to, uh, resolution number three, the role of family and communities in socialization of males and females, that is the issue of boys and girls. Socialization of children plays a critical role in their adult lives and how they relate to each, uh, to each in society. The way children are brought up should be in such a manner that they respect each other, irrespective of gender. The issue of boys, don't cry. Don't cry because you are a boy. It, it, it must be dealt away with. It's coming, it is something of the past, which is perpetuating gender discrimination and must be discouraged. There should be an engagement with different sectors of society to discuss this matter. And this should focus on institutions such as families and the community and also religious sectors, traditional leadership schools to educate society uh, customer in a, a, also on issues of kind of, uh, customer initiation should be used as a school to teach young boys on equality initiation schools. It must not be about uh, uh, that practice. What, 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 there's a surgery pra uh, practice only. There must be teachings there because they are told that they are men. Issues of succession and leadership within institution of traditional leadership. The regency and acting capacity of females in traditional leadership position may be, may be viewed as a right step towards the recognition of the role of women in traditional leadership. But a lot of challenges still need to be addressed as I'm a regent also, I'm holding the throne for the sun. The new class family may accept the acting regency, but the broader royal family always discriminate against. A woman is required to marry while she does not have a children, but the same is not required for the man who is marrying 
for, for traditional leadership, you, 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 for you to get married, yeah, they will ask, is she has got children or a child? No, we don't want that one. We want a virgin, someone who, who has got, doesn't have a child. But for the man who has been having children, because we know that if the issue, if we are talking about the issue of, of, of family planning, it's focusing on women, whereas um, the women can't have more than one child a year, but a man can have more than 20 children a year. There are those issues they need to be addressed because they, they are just uh, 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 discriminating. Recognition of women in traditional leadership in the struggle for liberation of the country. South Africa, women within the institution of traditional leadership also fought for liberation, but they are not recognized because those, some of the, of, of the men who went, for, uh, went to Robben Island, they went there with wives, but the wives are not mentioned there. The names are not mentioned. They are not recognized in other struggles, as Prince Pence Ngamashe has indicated. The Department of Traditional Affairs and the National House of Traditional Leaders should consider documenting accounts on all women in traditional leadership who fought for the liberation of the country and are still fighting for equality within the institution. The other uh, resolution, representation of female traditional leadership in such as the one I, I have already talked about. Also redefining gender relations within institution. The practice of perseverance in marriage, which we are told about as women, uh, you know, everything's going to be all right. Uh, persevere, persevere, persevere. It's not said by Gazella, it's not said to men to beg Gazella to persevere. It's only said to us to beg Gazella until you die. So those issues, they need to be dealt with. We talked about it as, as that was, was one of the resolutions. Also, institutionalization of positive message, messages around gender equality. The institution of personal leadership and the rest of South Africans should consider the slogan of women, women lives matter. Women lives matter. We need everybody to, 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 to adopt that slogan. That is coming from the traditional leaders. Also creating an enabling environment for women economic emancipation. We are not uh, talking about those small projects, uh, do, uh, uh, chickens, pigs, and other things. We want to, to, to be emancipated economically to own businesses as women in, from traditional communities. I, I didn't tell you that about 20 million of uh, communities uh, of people from South Africa, they reside on traditional communities areas. So we are saying we want to be emancipated economically as traditional leaders. We are working together with those, those responsible. Government, institu government and institutions must develop programs and pursue existing programs and partnerships to support economic development initiatives, most, mostly in traditional communities, specifically women. And, and we have got also have just launched the Rural Invest Strategy. That is focusing to prioritize women. We have, we have just launched that strategy as the National House of Traditional Leaders come on board and work with us. Uh, towards, the, towards my end, Let's also talk about building tolerance for people with different sexual orientation. That's us. We are talking about that now as traditional leaders. Most leaders, uh, persons in churches and traditional leadership, do not view homosexuals as people, but as they just review them, review them as things that must not have space in the society. You can even listen to other utterances from other people. It is important that uh, traditional leaders as well as uh, religious leaders learn to accept the sexual orientation of persons and not to discriminate against. 
if an a, a parent is a homosexual, that would be need to be to be discussed because, for instance, as I'm holding the the, the home the, the, the throne now, princesses, for my son, if he can be found that he is uh, got interest with other men in our areas, they will say that no, we can't be led by stubborn uh, here. They, they will be saying a lot of ways. How do we talk about those issues as traditional leaders and communities? And also making me that I'll be comfortable when I'm told that your son now has changed sexuality. How am I going to take it as a parent? So we need to have those discussions. Partners, are, we have got partners against gender-based violence. We, are, we have participated on the conference, which was held in 2018. You remember that that conference? You you I can't forget about it. Where where we had those panties there in front of the pre, our president raising our issues? You can't forget about that. We are there. But what is key here? That, that there's a there's a there's a plan which is the strategic planning. How do we make sure that is that strategic planning is implemented? Because we have noticed that the people who are po are put forward to implement that. They are not the most uh, people who are supposed to be participating. That is the people uh, like activists and other people. You'll find government officials uh, being uh, in, in front. Coming, to, coming to, my, to, to, my, to my conclusion, while on the other hand, the institution of personal leadership is committed to preserve culture, custom, and heritage, it, is also, it has also a responsibility of upholding the constitution principles and values to ensure social cohesion and nation building. That is also our role. We continue to invite and mobilize stakeholders to participate in programs and hold hands to fight gender-based violence and to achieve cohesive communities the Organization of Women in Traditional Leadership invite partners to work tirelessly with gender, communi gender uh, communities and, and also activists and other relevant stakeholders to turn the tide against gender-based violence, gender violence and feminism. I thank you very much for this platform, princesses. Wishing you all the best, as I know that before you started this platform, this organization, you consulted with me as a mother, so that you make sure that you do what is correct. So thank you very much and uh, wishing you all the best. Thank you very much, my children. Thank you, Mama. Thank you so, so much. Nkosi Kazin Oman Lam Shauli, Acting Chairperson of the National House of Traditional Leaders of South Africa. Thank you so, so much, Mama. So empowering, so thought provoking and informative, a wealth of wisdom that we walk away with. Let me just take this moment to thank each and every speaker that we have had and you also who was not speaking but decided to join us today. Thank you so, so much. Thank you to the different representatives of the different um, royal houses around South Africa, all the royal kingdoms, the royal majesties, royal highnesses, our dignitaries, representatives of government, private ent entities, NGOs in South Africa, Switzerland, Sri Lanka, Australia. It has been amazing. Thank you to the fourth industrial rev revolution that now the world has become one global village we can share input and, and, and wisdom across different continents. Um, that is it from me, Princess Lerato Mabalaniwa Bapiring. Um, it has been an amazing evening. I will now hand over to the founder of the South African Princesses Network, Princess Tela Silkao. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Pula. Uh, Pula, thanks, uh, Prince, Princess Mabalane. I uh, will hand over to Mr. Kirtin Bana, who is the founder of the Diplomatic Society and our partner in this particular webinar. Uh, over to you, uh, Mr. Bana. Thank you. 
וואו, זה היה... תודה, רייל היינס, סליחה. זה היה... real uh, eye-opening discussion. Um, you know, I can't believe we in 2021 and some of the things that still go on, uh, you know, we have to deal with. And I'm happy to uh, be part of the discussions uh, that have taken place. Our platform, uh, Diplomatic Society, is open to all uh, the princesses, especially uh, with the princesses network. To, we will, the, the, this uh, webinar will be on our YouTube channel. Um, and uh, we will be doing an article. Uh, it will be on our website as well as our newsletter, which goes out uh, next week. Um, uh, I will look at summarizing some of the, um, the issues that were brought up. But just to say, I mean, just to take from um, uh, Her Royal Highness, um, women's lives matter. Uh, I mean, um, the... the What, what, what's come to my mind and what I've been thinking about over the past few days was the human touch. Um, it has become such a profound um, action, especially with the, the COVID uh, pandemic that's taking place right now, the touch. People have been physically isolating, socially isolating, and the human touch has come to the fore. And when one looks at the human touch, It, it can provide comfort, can provide support, but also striking out. It can be harmful. It can, be, it can maim and kill uh, people. The human touch, um, also, you know, in terms of hugs and, and, and um, just a matter of, of providing support is, is so inherent to humanity. And how we look at this and how we exercise this human touch is where we should focus Um, our attention to. Um, there were many uh, discussions from many uh, of the women and, and uh, princesses here. Um, Mama Michelle spoke about her own experience, which was devastating and, and emotional, um, about issues in Guinea, about issues in Sri Lanka. I mean, Africa and Asia, you know, the cultures are so similar. Uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it's something that we could partner on and look at how we can look at some of the issues with regards to that. With regards to maybe some of the politics, governance issues, constitutional monarchies occur all over the world. The United Kingdom, Great Britain may be one of the big examples, but in Holland, in uh, the uh, Scandinavian countries, in Belgium, they have constitutional monarchies and how they function should also be something that uh, we can look at. Um, I was going to do an exercise, you know, about the human touch, where perhaps if you take your hand and you put it behind your head and you take your thumbs and you massage the back of your neck after such an emotional, intense uh, discussion, uh, you know, it helps relieve some of the tension. And just to perhaps come back uh, to the human touch. But I would like to thank every one of you for your inputs. Uh, it's been um, really eye-opening. And uh, welcome you to look at our website, uh, www.thediplomaticsociety.co.za. Look at our YouTube channel. Uh, we will be continuing these discussions. And hopefully um, next month, the Heritage Month, Tourism Month, we would like to further these discussions and look at how tourism, travel, hospitality, in terms of women's economic empowerment and um, plays a, a role in, in, in this regard. Thank you very much and thank you for, for joining us. I look forward to discussing further.